Hi everyone, uh, nice to see you. Uh, my name is Agustin Almanzi. I'm the Director of Sales Engineering at VNC Automotive. And I'm here to talk to you today about the evolving software landscape in the automotive industry and how open source can foster continuous innovation. So thank you for your time. Hopefully you find it interesting. Uh, I will leave some time at the end for, for questions. Uh, so uh, this is the agenda for the presentation. So we'll talk about why the automotive OEMs are racing to embrace software development and make it a key um, buying decision when you're deciding what your next car should be. We look at the uh, customer, how customer demand, and by customer I mean usually the, the, the driver, how their demand for the rich services that they're used to using in other devices like smartphone or computers has influence how the uh, technology in ABI has been progressing over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, we'll look at the uh, open source projects and standards that have been used as building blocks to enable such technologies that we have today. And finally, we'll look at the future and the opportunities um, that can be enabled by using um, such, uh, such open building blocks to continue innovating in the industry. So just first of all, in case you're not familiar with, uh, with our company, VNC Automotive, uh, we uh, started the company about uh, 13 years ago, uh, based in Cambridge in the UK. We, um, we were a division of the real VNC company who were the original creators of the VNC, the RFB protocol, virtual network computing, for uh, controlling one device from another by a uh, way of um, viewing the screen and sending the, um, the events remotely. So that was used mostly for enterprise use, but we were the automotive division trying to um, use that same technology inside the vehicle. And that's how we got into the IBI space and, uh, and such forth. Uh, so uh, yeah, our main business uh, is uh, automotive software and hardware. Basically, uh, basic, basically focused on the uh, device connectivity, so connecting different devices together to access uh, those services uh, in, a, in a kind of smooth and convenient way, as well as telematics and rear seat entertainment. Uh, our software is being used in around 30, 35 million cars today. So we have quite a long heritage in this, in this field. Um, and we have customers all over the world uh, Quite a lot of them focus in the um, in the Asian region, so we have offices as well in Korea, Japan, and China, and then we do a lot of business in um, West Europe, so Germany, France, those kind of markets, and then North America, U.S. and Canada. So, uh, based on you know our experience doing IBI projects and supporting customers in, in these different geographical regions, uh, we think we have some good um, you know some good uh, input and feedback on uh, on the presentation I'm going to to show today. Okay, so um, first, um, first part of the presentation. So uh, we'll look at the trends which are driving uh, the, the changes today in the, in the software, uh, in so, uh, software development in the automotive industry. So uh, as you've, you know, read on the news, uh, there's a lot of uh, very exciting new customer facing innovations happening at the moment. There's a lot of work being done on, uh, on ADAS. Uh, to um, you know, eventually uh, get to, um, to driverless, uh, fully autonomous driving technology. So there's a lot of um, deployments already around the world. So you know, Tesla is, is deploying this already in, in North America. Xpeng is deploying this already in some cities in China with, uh, with good success. And there's a lot of development uh, on, the, on the hardware side to enable this, right? So on the, on the sensors. Uh, whether using LiDAR as, as one approach or computer vision as, as, as another approach. Um, that, that's all coming together to, to, to enable this, um, this potential feature for the future. Electrification is another big, um, big area of innovation at the moment. So the car OEMs are very focused on improving the range of the battery, improving the efficiency of the motors to uh, you know, allow the, the driver to uh, to you know, charge the, the car as, as little as possible, and when they do have to charge it, to make sure it charges as quickly as possible, to make it uh, as, as smooth as currently it is with, uh, 
with the com uh, you know, uh, internal combustion engine. And they're doing a lot of development, not just the OEMs themselves, but also uh, you know, like governments and other, uh, and other industries around them into the infrastructure to make sure that there is that charging capability. And another big area at the moment of innovation is in the uh, device integration. So bringing other, devi uh, other devices uh, and interfacing them into the vehicle. So things like digital keys, where you can use your, uh, your phone or special uh, ID card to, uh, to unlock your vehicle. Uh, and also uh, smartphone integration, so being able to uh, connect into the vehicle from your phone to perhaps you know, you're upstairs in your house, you know you're going on a long journey before you set off. It's very cold outside, you can look, use, using the, um, the app for the phone, log into the vehicle and start the, the climate control so the car is nice and warm by the time you start. So all of this, all of this development is going on now and it's all very exciting. Uh, but uh, what's not so much talked about is the huge amount of new software that is needed to actually enable all of these uh, customer-facing innovations. So that's what I want to talk about, you know, how the automotive industry is coping with such uh, high amounts of, of new software developments. So uh, if we look a bit at the, um, the past, how have the automotive industry differentiated themselves? So that was always done through the hardware, so the hardware capabilities of the car. So that was the reason why I, as a customer, would choose one particular car OEM when I was buying my new vehicle over another one. Either things like engine performance, so you know how powerful was the engine, uh, things like acceleration, driving style, and also things like the, uh, the, the materials being used internally. So you know, usually you know, very expensive cars will have very expensive interiors, very comfortable leather seats and uh, wood accents and things like that. Another important buying decision was the reliability of the car. So as um, you know, the, the car, the internal combustion car is a very mechanical uh, set of components. Uh, a car OEM that can use a very high quality um, mechanics and optimize them very well can mean, means the car can last a longer time without so much repairs. Uh, and that was one reason that you, know, you may want to choose a particular OEM over another. So as you can see, that's kind of always been their expertise, you know, the nuts and bolts of, um, of, of what, makes, uh, what makes a car. So this, you know, this kind of focus on, on the hardware elements uh, you know, led the business model for them into repairs and maintenance. So you know, they sold you the car once, and then they will get some revenue from you over the coming years that you have the vehicle as different components of the car break down. Uh, you need to take it to the garage, change, uh, you know, change a tire or change some issue with the engine. They always, you know, they'll get a cut from all of these hardware, hardware parts. So that was, that was kind of the traditional business model. So as you can see, software doesn't really play a big part in this. Uh, in fact, because the software in the car until recently couldn't easily be updated, the software had to be as stable as possible, uh, and that main, meant it had to be as simple as possible, as an unambitious as possible, uh, to make sure that it was you know, as reliable and, and didn't require any, uh, any, any, any changes. So that meant the car OEM stuck to very, um, what I would say, you know, simple operating systems, like real-time operating systems, like QNX, for example, which are mostly focused on you know, just driving the uh, you know the mechanical aspects like the you know the, the sensors and the uh, the steering controls, driving controls, make sure that that happens in a very smooth and reliable way. The, 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 there is no uh, you know big capabilities in, the, in those uh, operating systems to provide very you know rich graphics or uh, very complex user-facing applications. But you know, things have changed in the last few years, uh, as, you, as you know, if you bought a car recently. Uh, and electrification is one of the, the things that have forced that change in the industry. So because of the, you know, the changing technology, the actual uh, engines have become a lot simpler. Uh, the uh, electric motors, uh, because they are simpler, require less components. They end up being more reliable, so they don't break down as often. And also, they are cheaper to manufacture and cheaper to assemble. Uh, and you know, because of these components getting cheaper and getting, um, you know, getting less complex, it means that more 
companies, more suppliers have got into the market and commoditized key components like the powertrains and the battery development. So that means that there's a lot of new car OEMs uh, jumping into the market. It's a lot easier to start from scratch and build an electric car. You can take your batteries from a company like LG in Korea, get your powertrain from some, uh, some European manufacturer, and then uh, you know, quite quickly you can put together a, an EV. So this, um, this means that the playing field has been leveled and there's not so much difference in the hardware components being used. So the decisions that um, you know, someone like a, someone's buying a new car um, are thinking about, uh, they don't see that much difference when they look at all these new, this new EV vehicles, right? So that means that if, you, uh, if you're a car OEM with a lot of hardware expertise before, you're struggling now to differentiate yourself over these other potentially cheaper um, uh, OEM alternatives. So that's one thing, but also the consumers, uh, the customers, they, uh, over the last 10 years, they have got used to very rich, uh, very powerful services using, you know, running on their smartphones, on their tablets, computers, those kind of devices. Uh, development has come a very long way there in terms of the software but also the user experience, you know, the look and feel, how easy it is to use them, how all the services talk to, talk to each other. And they're now demanding such functionality to be available inside the car as well. So people, uh, especially the younger generation, are now making their car decisions, not just based on the power of the engine, but also on you know, how easy it is to connect the smartphone, does it connect, you know, does it allow me to use my Apple Music account, those kind of things. So both of these uh, this kind of trends have kind of come together to, um, to make the car OEM start focusing more on the functionality of the, uh, of the ABI experience. And that meant that they had to you know, develop uh, software and start using software as a way to differentiate themselves uh, from the next OEM. So, um, so this is you know, obviously leading to a bit of a change in how the OEMs work and, and design uh, the software platforms. In the past, they would just specify a few high-level requirements and just let the tier ones make all the actual implementation decisions. Um, that um, led with a very fragmented uh, kind of experience. Uh, typically, you know, a car OEM will have multiple tier ones supplying different models or different geographical regions. Um, and that meant that you know, different tier ones will end up choosing different underlying technologies. The user experience will end up being a bit different. And it just means that the, well, both the, 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 the consumer and the customer um, you know, gets a bit of an a um, inconsistent experience. But also it means that the car OEM doesn't have that much control in terms of pushing new features and pushing fast uh, software development. Uh, because, like I said, it was all uh, kind of subcontracted out to, to, to the tier ones. So they're now trying to bring more of this in-house, and we, we've really seen this from, from some of our projects with them over the last few years. They are making the, the key decisions about what technologies and what features need to go into the next generation uh, platforms that they design. And they're also trying to bring software engineers into, um, into their uh, ecosystem as well. So things like the platform or some uh, high-level applications can be developed in-house uh, directly by, uh, by the OEMs. That means that they can more quickly uh, you know, uh, innovate and add new features and push, push new software. Um, you know, but this is, this is quite a, a kind of a fictitious um, um, ramp up. Uh, this, uh, the software needs that need to be met across many industries today. As you know, software developers are very, um, you know, very, um, in very high demand at the moment. So it's been quite a slow process to get the car OEMs to, uh, to recruit the right people. Uh, and also the kind, of, um, the kind of developers they already had in-house or that were already working in the automotive industry tend to be more low-level engineers, uh, more uh, experienced in things like C and C++, uh, looking at the, the low-level um, systems. Whereas now, you know, if you want to have very um, you know, nice and, and impressive looking graphics and animations and things like that in your, in your HMI, then you're looking more at application developers, which tend to be more, um, more experienced in the, in the smartphone platforms. 
Uh, but also there's a bit of a change needed in the, the actual mentality of developing software. Uh, in the past, the car OEM, when they were planning the next generation um, uh, head units, they will probably have five to seven years uh, lead time. So they start planning the specifications. The tier one then starts developing some of the software. Uh, there's a very rigorous you know, long duration testing and then eventually ends up in, in the next car that goes into the market in, in five, seven years time. Whereas now, you know, that, that, that needs to change. It needs to be much quicker. There needs to be a lot more, um, a lot more iteration. Um, again, more akin to what happens in the smartphone world where um, you know, applications and, and operating systems get updated very, very regularly, uh, kind of on a monthly basis as opposed to, to a kind of multi-year um, cycle that they used to have. Uh, so you know they're trying to get there, and uh, you know they are making good progress, but it is a big change. Uh, that, that screenshot I put there is uh, is taken from a recent Mercedes car. Uh, that's the interface for how to pair a Bluetooth device, which I think you know, can all agree still looks very uh, old-fashioned, very clunky, compared to the to the smooth um, UIs you see on your you know your iPhone or your Android phones. So you know it, it'll, there'll still be some uh, some ramp up to get there. So, uh, progression of our IBI services. So, um, we uh, will have a look now at uh, how the services that the user and the consumer is, uh, is demanding on the car, how are they being brought into the, into the IBI system over the last years, uh, 10, 15 years, let's say. So, we'll focus on uh, multimedia and device connectivity uh, because that's the features that customers are, um, are asking about. So, things like you know, navigation, uh, accessing their favorite music, uh, music content, those kind of things. Uh, but also, I'll focus on this area because that's the, the area that my company has the most experience in. So I have a good uh, insight into into how that's been progressing. And I'll, I'll, I'll spend a, a good amount of time uh, not just on the on the kind of the history of uh, of IABI development, but also on the key uh, open standards and open technologies that have enabled uh, that um, that functionality. And you'll see as I go through that that a lot of lessons are being uh, being learned, and a lot of decisions, uh, you know, the right decisions are being repeated and carried over into the next generation. So, how have these services been integrated uh, into the car vehicle in a safe way, a kind of a drive-safe way? That's what we'll look at now. So, um, you know, in the early days, you know, people were starting to buy things like iPods and. Um, portable uh, music players. They started accumulating a big database of MP3 files of the favorite songs, and they wanted a way to play that when they're in the car using the very, you know, uh, very nice, very powerful speaker system that comes built in uh, into the vehicles. So that was the first service that kind of found its found this way into the, into the ABI system. Um, Apple tried to develop a bit of a standard for this uh, using the, you know, the iPods and, and iPhone USB uh, connector, the old 30-pin um, uh, connector before the, uh, the lightning port came about. Um, but it didn't really catch on a lot. Uh, back then, Apple's market share wasn't as, as powerful as it is now. Uh, and you know, car OEMs were still very fragmented into, into how they, they embraced new technologies. So, uh, that didn't go too far. I think BMW was, was one of the main ones that, um, that adopted this, this connectivity. But you know, a few years later, uh, Bluetooth became the, the way to, to share audio uh, in, inside the vehicle. Uh, so that's been widely implemented now across, um, across different uh, cars, but also the smartphones and other devices, uh, consumption devices that, that the, the user brings into the vehicle. Um, so you know, Bluetooth is, a, is an open standard. There's a specification that anyone can adopt into the products. There's a robust certification program to make sure interoperability uh, works well. Um, but they still leave a bit of room for differentiation across the people implementing Bluetooth in their products through the use of codecs. So for example, you know, Qualcomm have implemented some, uh, you know, some high bandwidth, high quality uh, audio, audio codecs in, in their SOCs. Uh, that you know, Sony and Sony's done a different thing with their with their own product. So, you know, this this was a bit of a bit of an early early um, kind of success to, success story, I would say. So you have an open specification, uh, you have a good certification program, uh, and you still allow a bit of flexibility and customization uh, by by each of the people implementing it, so they can differentiate themselves. 
Uh, navigation was the next big thing to get into um, into the car uh, from from these kind of portable devices and, and kind of the online world. Customers were unhappy with the way that the native built-in uh, navigation uh, was was working uh, you, you know, because the software wasn't easily updatable back then in the car. Usually, it was quite outdated uh, or unreliable in some areas. Whereas people were getting used to you know, Google Maps and Apple Maps, those kind of services, which which were getting improved really quickly on the on the smartphone world. Uh, so uh, Ford was one of the first ones to try to bring this um, the smartphone navigation app into the vehicle. So they worked with a few specific app vendors um, based on their Ford uh, Sync uh, technology they tried to develop. But because it required a lot of work from the application developers um, and a lot of the key apps like Google Maps, for example, you know, was never really uh, on board. Uh, very, it was very limitedly, uh, very limited adoption. Uh, so the, the Car Connectivity, connectivity Consortium came, al came along a bit later. Uh, it was a group of all the major car vendors and the major uh, phone, uh, smartphone vendors. They tried to develop the first actual kind of industry standard for how to bring navigation applications into the IBI screen. So you know, they developed a specification that was available online. There was a certification program as well. Um, but uh, you know, this, this was you know, very successful. There was quite a few applications like Sidejig and a few other popular ones. And parking applications like Parkopedia, for example, uh, and it's been, it was widely adopted in in phone, uh, phones and cars. Uh, but you know, there's still still some roadblocks there. Apple never adopted Mirrorlink, for example. Um, certification prog program was quite tricky. Um, they put a lot of restrictions into how the app should look and should work. So uh, you know, a little bit of adoption, but um, it didn't really catch on in the in the industry. But there were some good lessons to, to learn from that, uh, which we will we'll see carried forward to, to, to into the more recent standards. Uh, so um, the Mirrorlink uh, standard decided to grab a few of the uh, open, source, uh, open, open standards uh, and protocols that were available uh, at the time, rather than try to reinvent things or do them in a, in a preparatory way. So for the kind of the screen replication, screen mirroring elements, they used the VNC protocol. And that's how we, you know, we became involved in, in this uh, a long time ago. Uh, uh, for audio, Bluetooth, as we talked about, uh, real-time uh, protocol for uh, high-quality uh, uncompressed audio over, over USB was used as well. Uh, and um, device uh, authentication, so you know, making sure that a certified phone was connected to a certified car, that was all handled through um, through uh, X509 um, certificates and um, public key uh, cryptography. And we, yeah, we'll see that being carried through to the other standards. Uh, and then you know, later on, they had added wireless support uh, using the Wi-Fi display uh, protocol from the Wi-Fi Alliance. And in terms of codecs to speed up the performance rather than sending um, you know, uh, uh, un uncompressed video data, uh, they embraced the H.264 standard, which was quite new back then. Uh, which is you know, backed by hardware acceleration on both sides and delivers good, um, good performance. Um, there's another standard you might have heard a bit about. Uh, so it's called Smart Device Link. So that was an alternative standard. Uh, still around today. The good thing about it is not just an open standard, it's, it's an actual open source project. So you don't just have to implement things yourself based on the specification. You can actually grab the full implementation from their GitHub page and quickly get up and running on your products. So that was using more of a kind of web, um, web technology approach, using JSON and, and RPC protocol for the communication. And then for the user interface, using HTML. And, um, and again, relying on H.264 uh, phone mirroring for some of the rich content like uh, you know, navigation, things that can't be put into a standard template of, of just simple data. Um, again, this had limited support uh, because uh, not many applications actually adopted this. You have to modify your application to, to enable this functionality. And again, all the popular applications uh, just, just didn't, uh, didn't go this way. But again, you know, the fact that this was, this was a, a fully open source project uh, was, was definitely the, a, a good step forward. So that takes us to uh, the last kind of five years, I would say. Uh, so um, Apple and Google finally uh, decided to Make it, make it possible to access 
these popular apps like Apple Maps, um, Google Maps, Apple Music in, inside an IBI system. So of course they did things their way. Uh, so you know, they created the standards, they handled the certification program. They're kind of fully in control of, of the HMI and how that should look. So that doesn't allow a lot of flexibility for the car OEM to differentiate themselves. If you look at the CarPlay screen on a BMW car, it will look the same as a, as a CarPlay screen um, on a Mercedes car. Uh, so you know, that is changing. Uh, Apple and Google have announced some, some new features to provide a bit more customization. But still, you, know, you really are giving a lot of control to, uh, to the smartphone vendors. So it's not ideal from the car OEM point of view. But it has been very widely adopted because it's already built into those operating systems. So the car OEM doesn't have to worry about the phone side. Application developers don't have to do a lot of work either because you know, there's a lot of good frameworks on iOS and, and Android uh, to just make your app compatible. So uh, yeah, it's been really widely adopted. Pretty much every car OEM these days, with some minor exceptions, um, support Android Auto and or CarPlay to um, enable you know, uh, music applications, uh, navigation applications, and even things like messaging, like WhatsApp, those kind of things. But uh, the interesting thing is you know, they, they used all the same standards that we talked about from the last technologies. So the video uh, stream is encoded using H.264 encoding. Um, authentication is handled again through X509 uh, public key uh, certificates. Uh, and you know, Bluetooth is used for audio and uh, there's other codecs for, um, for compressed audio uh, over, over Wi-Fi. So um, yeah, so that's kind of the up to the current standard. Uh, but if you look at the, this kind of current generation of vehicles, it's gone a bit of a step further. So now that cars, or at least some cars, have a reliable internet connection, rather than having to bring the applica application content and the internet connection from the phone, they can just run the applications directly in the, uh, in the ABI and use um, the, the built-in SIM card to get access to the music library and the, the navigation content. So these services are really integrated as web applications, or in some cases, uh, you know, people like Spotify, they will publish some, some web API that uh, you can then develop your own, um, your own uh, kind of client implementation um, using HTTP and, and JSON. So this gives the OEMs a lot more flexibility. Uh, so as you can see, there's a screenshot there from a, an Audi car at the bottom right for um, Apple Music integration. It looks like it's an application running on an Audi car rather than some uh, you know, iOS interface. So um, you know, that, that seems to be the way, the way, way forward. But of course, internet access is still not, um, you know, not completely widespread. There's still a lot of areas and a lot of countries um, where the connections are unreliable, and then you lose access to streaming to your music, and, and that's obviously still a big problem for, for the user experience. Uh, so in terms of the building blocks in the IBI stack, you know, we talked about how, um, how the rich services like music, navigation, and messaging have made it into the vehicle using all these open standards and open protocols. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, the middleware layer and then also the platform layer next. Uh, so a key aspect for, uh, in terms of middleware is authentication. So for, for pretty much any kind of interaction that you do between the IBI and either devices or content, uh, you, know, you must make sure you have a, a, a secure uh, authenticated connection. So that's done mostly with, um, with public key uh, certificates and X509 standard. Uh, you're probably all very familiar with OpenSSL. It's, uh, it's an open source project which implements all of these um, key cryptography uh, standards. So then you can very quickly uh, you know, add such functionality to, to your application rather than having to reinvent the wheel. And this is quite important, and this is kind of a lesson to carry forward, is that um, a lot of the times yeah, you need, to, you need to pick what you want to differentiate on. Uh, there's no point you reinventing the wheel on some very simple, um, not necessarily simple, but um, kind of you know, low level functionality um, that if you get wrong, like cryptography, can actually you know, bring a lot of new bugs and a lot of new issues into the system, relying on something that's already published and already very mature um, is, is usually the, the, the best way forward. Uh, so some some uh, recent uh, application of authentication in in the in the industry is this uh, digital key functionality. 
that a lot of the car OEMs are now embracing. So uh, the Car Connectivity Consortium, they've uh, developed a standard for this using, um, uh, you know, using kind of building blocks uh, like we talked about before uh, in terms of uh, you know, X509 and then in terms of the uh, communication channel between your phone and your, and your car, um, kind of short range communication in a secure way, either through NFC or, uh, or um, Bluetooth for, uh, for next generation. Uh, another important uh, layer of middleware is the car data. So uh, this is key uh, for many different applications. Uh, so you know, things like insurance usage, making sure that um, you know, the, your insurance company um, charges you accordingly to how you drive and your style, rather than some generic profile that, that might be incorrect. Uh, obviously things like uh, maintenance and fleet management are also key um, kind of consumers, let's say, of, of, of car data. Um, so you know, there are some standards in the industry for, for how to talk about car data across different um, entities. And there's this consortium called Cavisa, which you may have heard about. Uh, they used to be uh, called Genevi, Genevi Alliance in the past. They published this, uh, this open standard called the Vehicle Signal Specification. Uh, which is basically uh, kind of like a, a model, uh, kind of a language model for how to describe car data in the vehicle. I um, don't know how big that screenshot comes across, but it's based on this con concept of a tree. Uh, so you have, um, you, know, you have sensors being the, the blue elements, so things that uh, kind of pump out data. And then you have actuators, uh, the gray ones, uh, which uh, you can actually you know, get and set values uh, onto. And you know, this can then, you know, the branches can be grouped into, into, um, into higher level concepts. So you, know, you might have um, you know, like a, a wheel and then you might have four wheels and then you end up with that overarching system you can then kind of dig, uh, dig deeper to, to read and, and set different values on. Um, so you know, they make available a lot of tooling for how to change, uh, you know, how to um, generate uh, actual code. Uh, from, from the description that you set. And they still allow some vendor um, specific uh, functionality. Um, yeah, because you know, the way you, you know, maybe the unit that you talk in your system uh, for speed might be different from the one that another OEM has chosen. But it means that uh, you know, differ different entities looking at the same car data can, can have this common language between them. Uh, so let's look at the platform level. Uh, so um, in terms of ABI, uh, AGL is a great example of you know, pushing open, open source uh, implementations rather than writing things from scratch. So uh, as you know, uh, probably from the, a lot of the, the talks in this, uh, this, uh, this event, uh, it's an open source distribution uh, of Linux customized for automotive. So they've taken the Linux kernel and then they've added a lot of services and middleware uh, to um, make it easier for a car OEM or someone developing some automotive um, product like clusters or, or third party devices to, uh, to get into the market by just focusing on, on the key branding or the key um, kind of um, you know, um, differentiating uh, features. So you know, they use the Blue Z as the uh, Bluetooth stack, they use Wayland as the, uh, the, the mirroring system, um, the, 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 the windowing system. So uh, you know, reusing all of these open uh, standards and open protocols uh, internally. Uh, Android is uh, the other uh, big uh, player today in the, in the IBI. Uh, and you know, they have their open source project called um, Android Automotive. So this is version of AOSP, which has been customized to, um, uh, to work in the automotive world by giving you access to the vehicle um, hardware extraction layer. So then you can connect into your canvas or whatever system you have for, for reading and writing the, the, the car data. Uh, so that, you know, the operating system itself is open source. You can just stop there if you want, uh, or if you also want to use the Google services, things like uh, you know, uh, Google Assistant, um, Google Maps, you can then license their um, Google Automotive services, which uh, comes with a lot of requirements, a lot of restrictions, um, but you do get these great applications which you know, the customers really, um, really enjoy and means you don't have to build them yourself from scratch. But you know, there's a bit of a bit of a rift there. Um, some OEMs they have 
uh, gas and non-gas uh, models. So there's a lot of kind of disparity there. Um, uh, people like Stellantis, I was reading recently, they've launched uh, under automotive with Google services, but they're now decided to, to back away from that for the next generation because uh, running the Google services is very taxing on the, on the hardware resources. And also, as we've kind of covered a bit with things like Carplay and Nodoto, you know, Apple Maps, uh, Google Maps, I mean, uh, you know, will start looking the same in a Volvo car as it does on a Stellantis car. So, um, you know, there's a little bit, of, little bit of friction there, but there's no um, denying that Unreal is, is, is kind of here to stay in the automotive world. So, uh, just to uh, get towards the end, uh, where does that leave us in terms of the future? So, um, there's a key, the two key ways at the moment of pushing software to cars, uh, which have made things a bit easier in the industry, is over-the-air updates, uh, both you know LTE or Wi-Fi, depending on how, how new or old your vehicle may be. This is great because it means that uh, open source software that you're using in your platform can you know, receive security uh, patches often. So you know you may have rem you may remember things like um, hard bleed um, vulnerabilities a while ago in OpenSSL. Um, you know, it's very important to be able to patch these things quickly. Um, and also over the air updates means that you can, as a car OEM, you can push new services and features um, kind of quicker to, to your users. Um, you do have to be a bit careful. Uh, you know, there's already a um, bit of a trend of trying to push software as quickly as possible and then you know, force customers to install this massive um, you know, day one update to actually fix all the bugs that you didn't have time to fix before. Uh, and that's something that you see in the gaming industry. So you, know, you, you don't want that happening here in the automotive industry. But um, you know, clearly, there's a lot of flexibility enabled. And you know, subscription services is another impo important trend coming in. People are used to this from their phones and their uh, web services like Netflix and Spotify. Uh, and the car OEMs are starting to jump into this a little bit uh, as a way of um, getting a new revenue stream in the vehicle. Uh, so you know that this is quite good for the consumer. Uh, you know, it gives you flexibility. It means you can try some features before you actually commit to them, and it also means that you, you know, if you then decide to sell the vehicle, uh, you know, let's say like in the Tesla case over there, if you bought a full sale driving package for your vehicle for ten, twenty thousand dollars, you then sell your vehicle two years later, you then have to buy it again, or you know, you you lost that that, that that's investment. So you know, being able to enable and disable features as you your needs change. Um, it's, you know, it's quite a nice uh, user experience. Uh, and it, it encourages OEMs to keep innovating, right? Because if you have someone paying for the service, you want them to keep paying for the service. So that encourages you to keep adding new features, keep fixing the bugs that they report, and it will keep, keep improving the, the software. So in conclusion, um, we, you know, we looked at all this um, different, um, uh, you know, this, this model that's been used quite successfully in, in the IBI services with the combination of open protocols and open standards to deliver really rich experiences. And, you know, I think it can work well across the industry. Um, and then, you know, how you actually glue these building blocks together as a car OEM or as a device vendor and how you make the user experience as smooth as possible. That's how you're going to differentiate yourself and make you know, the, the customer choose your car over your competitor's car. So yeah, I encourage everyone to keep you know, developing and using such open building blocks uh, to keep pushing the innovation uh, forward. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, um, uh, we, are, uh, we have a booth uh, in the next, next ho uh, hall next door if you'd like to f uh, see more about this or, or um, hear more about it. Um, I think we have a couple of, couple of minutes maybe for questions, so if you have Anything you'd like to ask, either now, uh, let me know. If not, please come and find me. Yeah, hi. So I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Yeah, I'm trying to wrap my head around this subscription services model. Mm -hmm. So you showed the BMW service where you have to pay for heated seats, right? Yes. Now all of a sudden you have to pay for a feature that you expected to have mm -hmm. when you buy the car. And heated seats is one example. I mean the probably thinking of other services they want you to pay. You know, maybe you'll, you'll pay for a sport mode in your car or hit a steering wheel and all that. Have you seen anything to, sh to, to tell us whether there's customer acceptance for these things? Because my cynical view is that 
they'll still sell you the car at the same price, mm -hmm. and then they'll charge you extra right. for these services. And you yeah. know, that's my cynical view. Not no, no, I, I, that's definitely been shared. Um, you know, if, if you read about this, there's, there's been a lot of backlash about the um, the BMW um, heat seat uh, online already. Uh, customers are not happy about that. It's something like fifteen dollars a month. Which you know, if you're gonna have it for five years, that's a huge amount of money you're paying just to have this feature that, you, as I say, you had before. So, you know, I, I think they may have been a bit too aggressive about this, the car OEMs, and there will be a bit of bit of push and pull. Um, but you know, uh, it does have advantages for both the consumer and the OEM. So, we'll see how that pans out. It reminds me of what Ryanair did when they had to pay to use a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've seen this kind of thing as well in the, in the mobile space, you know, this whole um, subscriptions and, you know, things like in-app purchases and applications. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that will shake up in the in, in automotive industry as well. Okay. I think that's everything, guys. Thank you for your time.